Welcome to the Total Joint Preoperative Education class. My name is Ryan McIndoo and I am the Joint Center Coordinator here at St. Alphonsus Regional Medical Center in Boise. I'm going to educate you today on how to have the best outcome for your total hip or total knee or partial knee replacement. This class will also be helpful for you if you are having a revision surgery on either your hip or your knee. Here at St. Alphonsus, we do have a unique joint replacement program. We are tailored also to meet the community within the Treasure Valley, Eastern Idaho, or Central or South Central Idaho. We have trained orthopedic staff that work as a team to see you. We have physical therapy and occupational therapy that will evaluate you and let you know when you are moving safe. We have the nursing staff that will, of course, see you throughout your stay. The surgeons will make sure that you are surgically safe before discharge, and then the nurse practitioner hospitalist will evaluate you and make sure you are medically safe before discharge. We have clinical practice guidelines that we use that are both research and evidence-based to help make sure that we have proven approaches to your treatments. And so just know that there's a lot of research that goes behind your approach for the surgery and recovery. We do use a customized therapy approach based off what your needs are and what your physician's preferences are. And so what this means is that we can customize based off if you have stairs in your house, a tub shower or a walk-in shower, for instance, along with many other different um, unique things that you may have to deal with. We have a lot of patients who are discharging on the day of surgery. And we do have some patients who plan on a one to two day length of stay, but no matter what, just know that whenever you discharge, you will have to meet the same exact different uh, protocol to leave. This means again, that you are moving safe, surgically safe, medically safe. And our goal is to make sure that you have a uh, safe, comfortable and quick recovery. Understand that we will need you to have a family member or an adult to help you for the first three nights at home after your surgery. We call this person the coach. They're going to help with three main things at home, and that's going to be mobility, meals, and medication. When we say mobility, there's a lot of the stuff that you can do on your own if you want to say the grunt work. You can get to sitting the edge of the bed to standing up, of course walking, getting off and on the toilet. You can do those things on your own, but they're there to help make sure that you stay safe with all that. Bringing the walker to you, for instance, turning the lights on, opening doors for you, and keeping you safe that way. There are new meds you'll go home with. Your surgeon at your last appointment will go over these with you, or their PA will. But the idea is that you'll get new meds, and it'll be overwhelming for you to try to keep track of at first after your surgery. So this person will help keep track of when you last took this new medication, and when the next time that you can take that or should take that. This person should drive you to your first follow-up appointment. Depending on which side or which leg you had the surgery on, you won't be able to drive for at least two weeks and maybe even four weeks after your surgery. And so have this person lined up to take you to your first follow-up appointment after your surgery. When you think of a coach as someone who helps direct, or if the coach wants to think about it this way, boss around, the idea is that they're going to remind you of ways to stay safe and do things the right way, the correct way. And, uh, and keep you safe after surgery. So listen to what they have to tell you so that we have a good outcome. At this time, there are no visitor restrictions at St. Al's. And so if you need multiple people to come visit, if you have multiple coaches, for instance, that would be taking care of you at home, they all can come on the day of surgery and learn alongside with you uh, with therapy or whoever else is helping you, especially when it comes time to discharge, when we give discharge education. If you want multiple people there, that is not an issue. And then whoever is helping you at home, make sure that you tell them thank you. We understand that it's the help that you have at home is the way that you get to go home and, and have a safe and quick recovery. It is important to know that you will begin therapy on the day of your surgery, both physical therapy and occupational therapy. And it is also good to know that this will happen within hours of reaching the room that you will be recovering in. We do have goals set up for you, and one of those goals is going to be walking a minimum of 10 feet on the day of surgery. Know that this is for everybody. There are some who are more physically active than others, and for those who aren't as active, 10 feet can be a lot. But for most people, 10 feet is doable, in fact, doing more than that, and we'll cover that later. Um, keeping this in mind as well is that before you can go home, you need to be able to pass these therapies as well. 
you will continue to see each therapy as long as you are here, so just know that if you do not pass physical therapy and or occupational therapy on the day of surgery, that they'll continue to see you each day in the hospital that you are here. Physical therapy will start working with you on the day of surgery. The roles that they play is to help with functional, general mobility, and safety training. More specifically, this will include bed mobility on how to get in and out of bed safely, transfers, which will include how do you go from sitting to standing or standing to sitting. It also include walking with your walker and also keeping good posture during that. And then stair training as well, if that is appropriate for you. The other section that they will go over is strength and range of motion exercises. And this will be appropriate based off of your surgery and the surgeon's preferences. There are specific goals that you will have to meet with your physical therapist before you can safely discharge home. We will use the word independent multiple times during this section. When we say independent, that means that you can do these tasks either on your own or with very minimal assistance. Your therapist will be with you during these tasks to make sure that you are safe and also to give you pointers and education on how to do them the correct way. You will have to demonstrate that you can independently get in and out of your bed. Once you are sitting on the edge of the bed, you will then have to show that you can independently go from sitting to standing with your walker. Once you are standing, your therapist will have you start walking, and then the goal is to walk a minimum of 150 feet. However, what is more important is that you can do whatever household distance you will need to do at home, and do that without having to stop and sit along the way, that you can do them safely without getting too fatigued. You have to demonstrate that you can safely go up and down any steps that you may have to do at home. This is to keep in mind that we have multiple different types of steps that you can practice on. We have a mock staircase in our therapy room, as well as just a platform that you can step up on one step and then down off the other side of that, if that is all you have to do at home. You have to demonstrate that you can independently do any home exercise program that you may have or may not have. So keeping in mind that your surgeon may not have you do any uh, different types of therapy at home right away. And also you have to demonstrate that you can safely do these tasks at home. So showing us safety awareness is also what's important during these tasks. Next, we'll be talking about occupational therapy. What they deal with is educating you on how to do your activities of daily living and any assisted devices that you may have to use during this time. More specifically, what this will entail is how to do lower body dressing, how to get your underwear on or your pants on and off, also how to put socks on and off and shoes on and off. They'll go through all that and make sure that you can do those safely. They'll show you how to get in and out of a shower, keeping in mind that we understand there's different types that you have to get in and out of. So we do have a tub shower that you can practice on or one of the walk-in showers with a stall that you can practice getting in and out of, and then how to do that with a shower chair. They'll also go over toileting, how to get on and off a toilet safely, but also the hygiene portion of that and how to do that appropriately as well. Your occupational therapist will go over training on any equipment that you may need at home. What we do say is required for equipment to be able to discharge home are the following. A front-wheeled walker, that is a walker that is pictured here on the slide that shows wheels in the front and pegs in the back. You do need some sort of shower chair. You'll notice that we have two different types pictured, a regular shower chair and then also a tub transfer bench. A regular shower chair can be used for either a walk-in shower or a tub shower, whereas a tub transfer bench is more specifically for a tub shower. It is wider, so it does reach over the edge of a tub so then you sit directly onto the bench and can scoot yourself back and swing your legs over, uh, keeping in mind that tub transfer benches usually are more expensive. We also say that if you have a cane at home, this will make the transition easier from walker to cane to then walking without any assistance. And so uh, having that cane ready for when you are done with that walker. The other items I will mention are optional and keeping in mind that a lot of them are not covered by insurance as well. A reacher. This item is used for getting your pants on and, and different clothes for your lower body if you are having trouble reaching down to your feet. 
This can make it so that you can grab your pants, pick one leg up, and then pull the pants underneath the heel until you can reach it with your hands to then pull up all the way. Your shoehorn, that can come in handy again if you are having trouble reaching down to your feet to get your shoes on. A long-handled shoehorn can help with this part of it. And if you're having trouble getting shoes on, then you're having trouble with socks and getting those on. And so if you want to be independent with this part and not have the uh, coach help you with this at home, you can buy a sock aid. They come in two different varieties, a hard sock aid, which is more just a hard plastic, or a soft sock aid, which is more just fabric. And uh, you can use those where you put a sock onto the device itself, as you can see here. You'll pull it all the way up. As you can see, I'm showing the circle here. You'll pull the sock all the way up until the end of that. This is then where you poke your toes through, grabbing the straps, and point your foot down. You will then pull the socket up towards you. As it comes around the heel, you'll then pull your foot up towards you at a 90 degree angle. Keep pulling it and it will bring the sock up and around. They will also go over if you need a raised toilet seat and how to use that correctly. Keeping in mind there are different varieties. There are ones with handles, ones with not. Um, so if you are needing something to push up and off of to stand off the toilet, that's where the handles can come in handy. If you just need the extra height to be able to stand then the handles can be removed and that can be more handy as well for when it comes to wiping you don't have the handles in the way. Before using your walker please make sure it is adjusted properly. To adjust the walker to the correct height first stand in the middle of your walker. Hang your arms straight down at your side with your hands resting on the outside of the walker not the inside. Now adjust the height to where your wrists meet the hand grips of your walker. With these proper adjustments, you will have your hands on the hand grips and your elbows will be slightly bent at around 30 degrees. Now to start with walking, first stand with good posture. This means you are not looking down at your feet but instead looking straight forward. Do not stand hunched over, but stand as tall as possible. Take small steps. It will probably be easiest to first step with your surgical leg followed by your non-surgical leg. With time, you'll be able to walk with a more normal gait and step through with each step, letting the walker glide you along. When walking, please use the handles of the walker for balance and keep yourself centered within the walker. Prior to sitting into a chair, back up to the chair and make sure that your legs, the backs of your legs are touching the chair. You will need to be centered behind the chair. When you feel ready, move your surgical leg slightly forward. Support your weight on the non-surgical leg and reach for the chair arms. It is important not to use the walker to support your weight at this time, as the walker can slide out away from you, causing you to fall. When you feel ready, lower yourself into the chair. It is opposite order to standing, so just when you get ready to rise out of the chair, put that surgical leg forward Use both hands to push against the chair arms and then put both hands on your walker. Keeping your walker close to you, do not have your walker too far out in front of you when you go to stand up. Using a walker with stairs can be difficult and your therapist will go over how to do this after your surgery. Keep in mind though, the way that we say to do this is up with the good, down with the bad. That means when you step up, I'm gonna step up with the non-surgical leg and when I step down a step, I will step down with the surgical leg. Prior to using a cane, and just like with a walker, we need to make sure that it is fit properly before using. And just like with a walker, you want to hang your hands directly down at your side, have the hand grip for the cane come up to your wrist, so that when you reach your hand up to grab the hand grip of the cane, your elbow is slightly bent at around a 30 degree angle. When you are standing still, the cane should be approximately four inches to the side of your non-operative leg. This means the cane will be held in the opposite hand of your leg you had surgery on. It may feel awkward at first, but we are mimicking what it is like to walk normally. As you normally walk, your left arm swings forward as you take a step forward with your right leg and vice versa. The same applies to walking with a cane. If you were to hold the cane, in the same hand as the surgical leg, 
It will not help you walk smooth again and it is not as stable. When you're ready to walk, move the cane forward the same distance and at the same time as your surgical leg. They will mirror one, in, one another. The cane is going to mirror that leg as in the picture. Practice this at home prior to surgery and it'll take some time to get used to, but before long, it will become more natural. When utilizing stairs, just as we mentioned in the slide before, you go up with the good, down with the bad. You can talk with your therapist after surgery about how to do this exactly, especially considering some of you may or may not have handrails for the stairs that you may need to be using. Maybe it's a single step and maybe it's multiple steps, but talk with your therapist after surgery to get more guidance on this. Next, we'll discuss how to get in and out of a car after your surgery. For most people, the easiest kind of car to get in and out of is going to be your mid-sized SUV. Really what we're looking for is where the seat height-wise comes up to about the middle of your thigh when you're standing next to the car. If you have something that's lower like a sedan, you may use pillows or blankets to make it easier to get the seat a little bit higher for you to get in and out of. Before getting into the car, first things first, have the seat rolled back all the way and then slightly recline the seat back as well. You are going to use similar rules as when you go and get into a chair. Back up with the door open until you feel the door jam hit behind your legs. Keeping in mind that you have to keep the walker with you the whole time up to this point. Then you're going to move your surgical foot slightly forward. Reach back with one hand and help lower yourself down onto the seat using any grab handle or the door frame that's available. Don't forget to tuck your head forward to avoid hitting your head on the door frame. After you're seated, you can then scoot back more onto the seat. Lift your legs up one at a time and into the car. If you're having trouble or having a harder time getting your legs into the car, you can grasp underneath with both hands under your thigh. You can then lean back and lift your leg into the car this way. This is where it becomes important to have your seat rolled back and then recline back some to give you the most room possible to do this. Get, into, get your seat set comfortably for the drive and then when it's time to get out, just do everything like this in reverse order and then make sure that walker is right in front of you before you stand up. Just like getting out of a chair, don't have it too far forward, have it right next to you, uh, right in the door jam. So then you stand up, you can transition from pushing yourself up off the seat to then grabbing the walker itself when you stand up. It is also important to practice all of this prior to your surgery. So do the best you can right now. Practice it. Make sure you get comfortable with it because this is one of more of the awkward things that you have to try to do after your surgery. When discussing safety as far as getting in and out of a tub shower or a walk-in shower, here's the main thing to remember. Falls can happen during bathing. Water makes the bathroom a very slippery place. So just make sure that you use a non-skid mat if appropriate to help prevent falls while in the shower. What can also be helpful is to have a handheld shower faucet in combination with using your shower chair, which reminder, regular shower chairs are more appropriate for a walk-in shower. And if you have a tub shower, if you can get one, a tub transfer bench is gonna be more appropriate there. This will help you to be able to sit down and then reach all the areas necessary to bathe. Do not lean on things when you do get inside the, the shower itself. That means I'm not going to be supporting my weight with a towel bar or a shower curtain or a shower door, those sorts of things. Only use actual hand bars that are attached to the wall and meant for this purpose. When getting in and out of a tub shower, this can be a little bit trickier. The main thing to remember is that you want to use this just like you're getting into a chair where you step backwards until you feel the tub behind you. At this point, stick your non or stick your surgical leg forward, slightly farther than the non-surgical leg. Reach back for the shower chair itself, and then slowly lower yourself using your hands again on the chair to help lower you down. Do not keep your hands the entire time on the walker. Once you're sitting, you can then scoot yourself back. Whether you're using a transfer bench or a regular shower chair, scoot yourself back, and then you'll lift your legs one at a time over the edge of the tub and then get yourself comfortable and, and perform shower when you are done it's all in reverse order lifting your legs back up and over the edge scooting yourself closer to the edge having the walker right in front of you 
and then having one hand back at least or two hands and then one hand at a time reaching up and grabbing the walker as you stand up but do not have that walker too far in front and reminder not to slip on anything make sure that you're not stepping directly onto a wet surface that you can slip on as far as getting in and out of a walk-in shower this might be uh, sound a little bit different than what you may think you should be doing with this, but many people have to walk in backwards into a walk-in shower, unless you have a very large one where it's easy to turn around and then sit down onto the shower chair itself. So for most people, what you will do is you'll turn around and then slowly, little tiny steps, walk backwards until you feel the, the lip of the shower hit the back of your feet. At this point, very carefully, one step at a time, step up and over the lip, and then bring the walker back with you. When you're inside the shower, you'll then walk backwards onto the, or right behind the shower chair itself, and just like getting into a chair, you will sit down on the shower chair itself, get the walker out of the shower chair, we don't want that to get too wet, and then perform your shower. When you get out, you're gonna walk forward and up and over the lip like you would normally do. Another thing to keep in mind, your post-operative bandage is waterproof, but what you want to do is please make sure it is not peeling off to help maintain a seal and avoid water leaking under the bandage. Once you're discharged from the hospital, your surgeon may want you to start doing some home exercises. What you need to remember is that our total hip patients usually do not start any physical therapy or even home exercises after surgery. If you feel that you may need to do some physical therapy, we'll discuss this with you at your two-week post-operative appointment. For a total knee patient, most patients will start doing exercises 24 hours after surgery and then start outpatient physical therapy after the two-week appointment. As far as the best exercise you can do after surgery, that will be walking. We want you to do this and get up every two hours when you're awake during the day and be up for about five to 15 minutes. You can do simple tasks like going to the bathroom or going to the kitchen to get something to eat or going to take a shower, but every two hours during the day, get up for about five to 15 minutes to do a task. At night, please just sleep. You do not have to get up every two hours at night. If you have had a knee replacement, here are the exercises that you will perform. We call them the big three exercises. Again, you start them 24 hours after your surgery. You'll do these exercises once a day and each exercise you'll perform a total of 15 times. The first one we call a straight leg raise. To do this exercise, sit up straight and on the edge of the chair with your surgical leg extended out straight in front of you. Lift your leg straight up to the height of the chair seat and make sure that the top of your thigh, those are called the quadricep muscles, make sure those are contracting and that you're using those. Hold it there for a count of three and then slowly lower back down, again doing that 15 times. The second exercise is called a chair slide. To do this exercise, make sure that you keep your feet planted on the ground and that you're sitting back in your chair, sitting straight up. Make sure that surgical leg, that the foot is planted on the ground. You can have it slightly out in front of you and just like you're gonna get up and stand out of a chair. But what you're gonna do is plant your hands each side of the chair, keeping your foot planted on that surgical leg and then slowly scoot your, foot, your butt forward on the chair, bending that knee. We're doing what we call passive motion. So what can help is to make sure that your thigh muscles are relaxed and not real tight as you do this. Uh, to help with that, keep in mind if you're tense elsewhere, you're gonna be tense on your thighs. So make sure that your jaw isn't tight and that your shoulders aren't tight. Relax those and then relax your leg. And when you scoot forward, again, you'll get a bend in that knee. Our goal by the two week mark is that you will have a 90 degree bend in that knee. Just like you see here on the picture for this exercise, the foot that is out in front, that is roughly a 90 degree bend in that leg, which is the left leg in that picture. That's our goal. Hold it there and then count to three and then slide back in the chair. If you feel you can get a, a slight more bend than 90 degrees, that's fine. Really, you can do 90 to 100 degrees those first two weeks and, uh, and go from there, but don't overdo it. Again, perform this 15 times. 
The last one is called a chair hang. You do this exercise by sitting on the chair and then put a chair out in front of you and put your heel on that chair. This allows gravity to gently stretch the, the knee back to a straight position. Again, keeping in mind that you want your muscles in your thigh to relax, just as in with the second exercise. Keeping your toes pointed upright, do not let them drift to the side, and use your arms on the chair to help assist if necessary, but you'll hold that position for 15 minutes or what you can tolerate. I do not expect you, you know, the day after surgery or so to be able to do this for 15 minutes, but do what you tolerate, and our goal is to get up to 15 minutes. Again, perform all these three exercises once a day. If you are doing really well and have no increased pain or swelling, then you can try to do these exercises later in the day for a second time. But do not push that right away. It'll take time before you can do that. It is possible after surgery that you may have certain restrictions or recommendations depending on your surgery. For hip replacements, we'll talk about that first. There may be precautions that will be applicable to you keeping in mind that there's a few different approaches for hip replacement. First of all, if your surgeon tells you anterior approach is what you're going to be having for your surgery, there are no restrictions involved with this. However, what we will tell you is that you still need to make sure that you are not overdoing things and that you're keeping all your movements within reason. You also should listen to your pain and let that help guide you with what you can and cannot do. For instance, if you're reaching down to your toes to try to get socks on and it starts to hurt as you're reaching down and getting close to your toes, don't push through pain to then try to get your socks on. Let that be your limit and figure out a different way to try to get your socks on, whether that's using an aid or having someone help you with it. So while we have no set restrictions, still let pain dictate what you can and cannot do in some of those circumstances. As far as a posterior approach hip, your doctor will tell you whether you have these two different types of approaches for precautions. When we talk about these precautions, these are in place for roughly six weeks to make sure that the soft tissue, so essentially the skin and muscles and everything, heal as they should around the joint. Most likely you will be given modified precautions after a posterior approach. That means that we do not want you really twisting the leg or the upper body or try not to cause that foot to turn inward. In doing so, it can cause a risk for having a dislocation. We also say we do not want you crossing your legs at your knees. It is okay to cross your legs at your ankles, but no further like up to the knees. As one of the surgeons also says, when in doubt, keep your knees out. And what we mean by this is don't be reaching outside of your legs or your knees down to your feet. Keep everything between your knees, so keep both hands between your knees as you try to get dressed and reach down to grab something off the floor if you're sitting down, getting your shoes on, getting your uh, your socks on, hands between the knees, okay, and when in doubt, keep your knees out. It may be that you have strict restrictions. This is rare, but if this is the case, we will tell you that we do not want you turning that foot inward like we already mentioned, so no twisting. We do not want you to bend past 90 degrees at your hip. This would mean that you cannot reach your hands past your knees. We say no crossing with your legs at your knees or your ankles. And then what we do not want you to do is a combination of turning your foot inward and then bending down as well. So uh, just keep all that in mind. Again, that is rare to have those strict restrictions for those six weeks much more common that we see what we call modified restrictions with a posterior approach for six weeks. And if you have an anterior approach, we say no restrictions for those six weeks. And um, But again, letting pain dictate what you can and cannot do as far as movement as well. And keeping everything within reason. As far as knee replacements go, we want you to both bend and straighten that knee, which, you know, this is like what we mentioned with those exercises bend and straighten the knee with a goal of having a zero degree straight knee and a 90 degree bend or flexion in that knee. We do not want you to rest with your knee in the bent position. So what I mean by this is at night, I don't want you having your knee really bent as you sleep or when you're sitting in a recliner, your legs are gonna be up in the recliner, 
not with the reclining leg down and watching a whole movie that way for those two hours until you get up the next time. Keep your knees in a more straight position while you're resting. And this is going to be for both hip and knee patients. You are both going to be weight bearing as tolerated. What we mean by this is that you can put all your weight through your joint and it is not going to cause any harm. It, is, it will hurt doing so, but the hurting is not going to be causing any harm. So just keep that in mind. Just because it hurts does not mean you are causing harm to that joint. You are safe to put your weight through that immediately after surgery. As far as tolerating it, if you are not tolerating it, your therapist will teach you afterwards about how to use your walker to help walk in a way that you more tolerate when going through those steps. We also want you to avoid limping as much as possible and as soon as possible after surgery. The whole goal is that we have a good joint in there now and that we are going to try to get back to normal as soon as we can. Having a nice steady gait and smooth gait after your surgery will aid in your recovery. And we'll teach you on how to do that afterwards. Some good reminders is don't be walking with your legs straight if you are a total knee patient. Another way to think about that is walking like you have a peg leg. We want you to bend that knee and walk heel to toe, rocking that foot with each step that you take with the surgical leg. With a hip, sometimes people want to walk that hip up and they lift their foot up by lifting their pelvis up on that side. Again, use the hip. Walk heel to toe, bend the knee, bend the hip with each step, and then heel to toe, rock the foot forward as you walk through on that step. Use the hip and walk as smooth as you can as soon as you can. A lot of people have questions about sleeping. How do I sleep? Again, follow restrictions for that hip replacement if you have those. But what you can do is sleep on your back. You can sleep on your side, whatever is comfortable. You most likely will feel like your princess in the pee for a little while, so have some pillows ready to stay comfortable during this time. And that uh, you have pillows between your knees, for instance, or to lay into behind your back or in front of you, but have plenty of pillows to stay comfortable. And there are some of you, too, who will feel most comfortable sleeping in a recliner for a little while. If that's the case, that's fine. You can you know, spend a few nights sleeping in the recliner if that's what's most comfortable, making your way eventually to sleeping back in the bed. And as your pain and, uh, and everything becomes more comfortable, then you'll be able to sleep more and know that this can take some time. Hi there, my name is Emily Clay. I'm a registered and licensed dietitian here at St. Alphonsus. I was asked to be part of this presentation to discuss how nutrition can support you in the healing process um, in multiple different ways. So we're going to talk about nutrition and healing. We're going to talk about blood sugar control and decreasing our A1Cs, if that is something we need to address. Um, maybe weight loss, if that's something that may be beneficial for you and your new joint replacement. So to start off, we're just going to talk about nutrition and healing. So there is a lot of research that proves that if we have good protein stores going into any surgery, you heal better. So as you kind of prepare for your surgery, try to increase more protein into your diet. We know that surgical outcomes are better when we do this. We also know that after surgery, protein plays a huge role in healing. It helps heal our skin, our joints, helps maintain our muscle mass. It helps build muscle mass. So, so protein you'll hear a lot from me today. Um, some good protein sources are listed there. Obviously our meat sources like fish, chicken, turkey, beef, pork, tuna. Those are all great protein sources. Um, Greek yogurt, 2% cottage cheese, protein supplements or drinks, eggs, string cheese, low sodium lunch meats are also good protein sources. And then if you are more vegetarian, beans, tofu, edamame, lentils, those are also pretty good protein sources that we can um, start consuming before your surgery and then continue afterwards. And that way we know we're getting a lot of protein um, which will help your healing process. Some more information on protein. Because it is so important, um, we know that protein can help stabilize blood sugars. Protein by itself typically does not raise our blood sugars. 
So by incorporating more protein into our diet, our A1Cs can improve, our blood sugars are more stable, our energy is better, um, and we know when we're doing all of those things, if weight loss is a goal of yours, having more stable blood sugars will help in that goal. Protein also helps build and maintain our muscle mass. So eating adequate protein does not make you muscular. Exercise is what creates muscle mass, right? But if you wanna repair that muscle mass and get stronger, you need to be eating adequate protein. Not only protein, you need to be at eating adequate calories to do so. So by eating you know, three meals a day, every time you eat, have a protein source, that makes that a little achievable. So a good practice is that you try to have a protein source at every meal and every snack that you consume. So an example of a snack would be like a small piece of fruit with a cheese stick. So you have a carbohydrate, which is the fruit, and then you have a cheese stick, which is a protein source. Um, maybe you will have some baby carrots dipped in peanut butter, for example. You have a vegetable with a protein source. Um, sliced cheese with six whole wheat crackers. So if you can kind of get in the habit of adding a protein source to every meal and snack, this will help your overall health and well-being and certainly support your energy and mood and those kind of things. If you are interested in weight loss with before, before surgery or after, um, we really need to be feeding our bodies adequately. So by eating one meal a day is not supporting your body, right? You're, there's no way you can get all the nutrients that your body requires on eating one meal a day. So we should, try be, uh, we should all be trying to eat at least three times a day. So breakfast, lunch, and dinner, whatever that looks like for you. And then at every meal, you have a protein source, like eggs, meat, or dairy. You have a fruit or vegetable, um, which is great fiber. It's great for our heart health, our brain health, our gut health, all of the things. Whole grains. Now, whole grains typically have a little more fiber um, and nutrients in them. So switching to brown rice or whole wheat pasta or whole wheat bread or whole grain bread, um, it's a great energy source. Um, carbohydrates do give us energy and they shouldn't be avoided, but they should be part of the meal and not the entire meal. We should be consuming healthy fat sources like olive oil, avocados, avocado oil, nuts, seeds. Um, we should try to limit butter and fried fats and trans fats, um, fried foods, I mean. Um, so by adding healthy fat, and, and a whole grain and a fruit and vegetable, we feel more satisfied. Your body has gotten a complete meal, which can help with, you know, boredom eating or snacking or cravings, all of those things. So if you eat three good meals with all of those things included, oftentimes you feel more in control of the snacking and, and some of the things that some of us deal with. Um, it helps with blood sugar control when we have all the things at each meal. Um, so, so really strive for that. And I have a picture um, of this on the next slide. But the other thing I wanted to mention about weight loss is monitoring how much um, sugar you're consuming. We know that, that A spikes blood sugar, B is not nutritious. It's not offering your body any nutrition really. Um, and pay attention especially to our liquids. Um, if we can cut back on high sugar beverages like soda, specialty coffees, Gatorade, sweet teas, lemonade, um, those kind of things, it's an easy way to get um, less calories consumed, which can help support weight loss goals. It helps with our blood sugar control and which helps support our weight loss goals and our A1Cs and healing and all of that. Um, so pay attention to that. We should all be striving for about 64 ounces of water unless you have some sort of cardiac issues where your cardiologist told you that you should be not drinking that much. But 
adequate for most people with about 64 ounces of water. So strive for that every day. We know that for adequately hydrated, sometimes that can prevent cravings and that kind of stuff. So water is, is good for that. Um, we should be focusing on non-caffeinated, non-carbonated beverages for most of our um, beverage intake. So this is a good guideline. If we're trying to eat a good protein source, fruits and vegetables, whole grains, this is kind of a visual picture on what that might look like. So on the top right hand side of the plate, you can see whole grains. So using like whole wheat bread, whole grain pasta, brown rice, um, and the portion size is about a quarter of the plate. Right below that is your healthy protein. So fish, chicken, beans, um, pork, fish, I think I said that, um, these are great protein sources. So, you know, a little more than a quarter should be your, your protein. Um, so you have that on there. And then you can see that the vegetable piece of that plate is a little bit bigger, right? Because vegetables tend to be high in fiber, um, low in calories. They are typically um, not raising your blood sugar, right? Um, and then obviously having a little fruit with every meal and snack. This is how we get our fiber up, which is great for our heart health and our brain health and our digestive health. Um, so have your plates, fruits and vegetables. And if you can model this for most of your meals, you're eating a very balanced plate. And then obviously in the top left there, it says healthy oils. We should probably be eating, um, cooking with olive oil or avocado oil or even canola oil. Um, you know, limiting extra butter and, and those kind of things because those are saturated fats. But it doesn't mean you can't have them all the time, but it's it's trying to just change the way we're looking at our plate and how we're um, doing that. Okay, so in conclusion, um, nutrition does help with the healing process, blood sugar control, any weight loss or weight gain goals you may have. If you feel like that you would benefit from having something a little more individualized, if you have food allergies or lots of food preferences, we can certainly work with you one-on-one. -on -one. Our number is listed there. It's 208-367-7190. Even if you have a quick question, please don't hesitate to call. And I think that's it. So. I wish you well and hope you have a great day and look forward to hearing from you if you need to. So thank you. I am done with the therapy portion. Now we're going to talk about preparing for this. You know that we'll talk a lot about how to minimize complications. This is not to cause any anxiety. This is to let you know and educate you on what you can be doing that will help you based on a lot of evidence-based practice. So what is research telling us will help you. And I want you to know those so that you have a good outcome. Now for those of you who do have pre-surgical screening, this is mostly for Boise and Nampa. Here is what you can expect for this. If you are Ontario or Baker City, they may do this in the office. As far as pre-surgical screening, it will be scheduled for you. You do not have to worry about calling them to then make an appointment. It will be done by the office for you and you will be given the date and time. Expect that this appointment will be one to two weeks before your surgery. The purpose is to obtain baseline information about you. We want to do things like lab work and see how that's looking. Maybe we're going to do a EKG to check your heart health. They're going to want to get to your health and surgical history. 
We'll do a lot of testing just to make sure that you are safe for the surgery before it happens. In Boise, there will be a nurse practitioner hospitalist that will see you at this, at this appointment and they will evaluate you after your surgery as well. Bring a list of the medications you take to this appointment. Do not bring the medications themselves unless you are coming to the hospital for your admission and you can bring multi-use items such as eye drops, inhalers, and nasal sprays. Those multi-use items are okay. You'll need to get clearance once you get in the hospital. Let them know you brought them and we'll get it okayed. Anything that is pill form, we will provide. The nurse will tell you what medications they want you to take the morning of your surgery. They'll tell you this at this appointment. Do not be surprised if they tell you to stop taking aspirin or other types of NSAIDs such as ibuprofen or naproxen. Tylenol is not going to be on that list. It is safe to take because Tylenol does not affect your bleeding. These other NSAIDs do. This will include all over-the-counter urban supplements and multivitamins. An example of an urban supplement that does affect your bleeding is turmeric. A lot of people I see take, they take this for pain relief with their joint but this will affect your bleeding and so they'll have you go off of this prior to your surgery. They'll have you stop these at least seven days prior to your surgery unless you take aspirin for heart related issues. If that is the case, they'll tell you when to take it um, until a safe period of time and then stop. And this can be for any type of anticoagulant. If you take that currently before your surgery, they will also tell you at this appointment when the safe period of time will be to stop it and then restart. At your pre-admission testing appointment, they are also going to hand you a scrub that you'll go home and use. It's called chlorhexidine gluconate, CHG for short, and the brand name is also called HibiCleanse many times. This scrub will clean bacteria off your skin and the goal is to reduce your risk for infection by doing so. You'll use it a total of three times, but you will start two days before surgery, and then you'll finish with the last time the day of your surgery. An example would be if you have a surgery on a Monday, you will start Saturday, second time would be Sunday, and then the third time would be Monday, the morning of the surgery. I'll give you some basic instructions right now, knowing that you will get a handout with more specific instructions on it, along with education at the pre-admission testing appointment by a provider given straight to you. First of all, do not reuse any sort of towel, whether it's washcloths to rub the scrub on or with a towel that you dry yourself off with. Make sure that you throw those in the dirty clothes right when you're done and have clean towels ready for the next time that you use it the following day. You do want to clean and put some clean sheets on that bed the first day you start using that scrub. Do not use lotion after performing the scrub. The idea is that we will not be perfect each time that you use the scrub with perfect coverage everywhere that you need to. So you may miss some tiny spots, but all three combined, we get great coverage with the scrub. So if you use lotion and you miss a tiny little spot and there's some bacteria on the skin there where you missed with the scrub, then you will rub that bacteria all over the place and we're back to square one. And then we say do not shave your legs for seven days prior to surgery. All we're trying to say here is we do not want any large cuts or anything like that. Come day of surgery, especially on the surgical leg near the surgical site, uh, we just do not want a site for infection to come in. On page five, it's gonna go over how to clean and prepare your home. I'll go over the basics here real quick. Make sure that you have all your laundry ready, including clean towels, washcloths, and sheets. Once you start using that soap we just talked about, the scrub, please do not let pets sleep in bed with you. This will also go for at least two weeks after your surgery. Pets can cause a risk for infection, and we wanna have them completely off the bed just so that nothing happens. So not even on top of the covers, we need them off the bed. If your pet does like to jump up on the bed in the middle of the night, then we do need to get them out of the room, have a plan in place for this. I do understand that this can be a big headache for a lot of patients out there, but know that this is to make sure we limit the risk for infection and that you have a good outcome for the surgery. Pick up any throw rugs, electrical cords, any tripping hazard, get it out of the way. This will ensure that you have clear pathways with your walker and that you don't trip over anything causing any injury. I also recommend practice with your walker ahead of time. So if you can get your walker before your surgery, practice going through your house. Make sure that you can get through your hallways, through your bedroom without having any furniture in the way. 
and that you can also figure out how to get in and maneuver around your bathroom with your walker. Again, falls, the most likelihood of where they will happen is going to be in the bathroom. So practice with that walker. Figure out, do I need to walk through the doorway sideways because you live in an older house with a skinny doorway for the bathroom? If that's the case, figure out how to do that safely. And I, again, always recommend when you go to the bathroom, keep the walker with you. Um, what I do not want to have happen is to where you have a fall walking to the bathroom because you're in a hurry. The, have your prioritization like this. I'd rather have you have an accident where you have to change your underwear and your pants rather than have an accident where you fall and injure the knee or hip or injure your head. So just know that you can always clean it up if an accident happens, right? If you don't make it to the bathroom in time. But having an accident happen where you have a fall, we do not want that. We can avoid that. Practice going through your house, how to maneuver around everywhere, and this will help make sure that you have everything made easier when you go home after the surgery. For what to bring to the hospital, page 4 goes through all of these items that would be necessary to bring. Keep only to these necessary items, and that will make our life and your life a lot easier, especially when you don't have family that can come help bring items in and bring items out. As far as the booklet that we're going over today, the patient guidebook, bring that with you when you come to the hospital. Also, if you have a living will or advanced directive and it is not in our system here at St. Alphonsus, please bring that with you the morning of surgery or a copy of it. We will scan it through into your electronic record and it'll be there from that point on. It is important to have, especially for patients who say have confusion after anesthesia, um, that sort of thing. Many times power of attorneys are listed in these documents and it lets us then go to talk to the people whom we need to talk to that you would like to advocate for you and just help make the decisions that need to happen, whether it be figuring out the discharge process that sort of stuff. It'll just help smooth anything out, and especially during this time where it's not as easy to have, again, visitors come in and speak for you. This helps out tremendously. Comfortable, loose-fitting clothing, shorts or pants, one or two changes. Now, shorts, those can be more comfortable for a total knee patient, mainly because pants can tighten around a knee when you bend it. So whether you're standing to sitting, moving around in bed, whatever it might be, shorts can be more comfortable. As far as pants go, you can still wear those. In fact, um, sometimes, again, they're more comfortable for you. Or hips, you can wear shorts or pants. It does not matter. But you do want to have something with a elastic waistband. So an elastic waistband will be more comfortable because swelling will set in, and anything too tight will get uncomfortable or at least make it more difficult to get on. So something loose-fitting with an elastic waistband. For women, if you want to wear a nightgown, that's completely fine. I highly recommend, though, bring whatever you plan on wearing at home so that you can practice getting changed into those items rather than having to figure it out when you go home. Rubber soled shoes with the back. Easy to on and off, closed heel, closed toe. So like I mentioned earlier, orthotic shoes are fine with elastic shoelaces. You can wear slippers. That's fine as long as they have a rubber sole with the back to that heel. You, I do not want to see anything like a Birkenstock or Crocs or flip-flops, anything like that that can slip off real easily because then what happens is the tripping hazard. So be safe with that. Wear something that will stay on when you walk and have that rubber sole to it. Personal hygiene items. We have the basics. We can provide shampoo, body wash combo, a toothbrush, toothpaste, you know, anything that you can think of, we've got that. But if you want to bring your own items, you can. Walker. Have that thing labeled, at least with some sort of identifier on it. That way, during the day of your surgery and after, it's easy to make sure we have it with the right person as you move from one place to the other. 
CPAP or BiPAP, if you wear one of these items, please bring the mask and the hose that attaches the mask to the machine. Bring those two items. If you want to, we are allowing you to bring the whole machine as well, as long as you do not put too much oxygen on it at night. What I mean by this is if you have to do supplemental oxygen, that may become a barrier with using your own machine in the hospital. Um, if you do not have that barrier, then you can use your own and it can sometimes make life a little bit easier. When it's time to sleep, you let the nurse know how to set your machine up. We turn it on and that's it. Rather than having to use our own machine where we have to go have respiratory therapy, gather the equipment, bring it up, and then get the settings that you use at home onto this new machine. It can simplify things by using your own machine. There is a waiver involved that you will have to sign that does state that we did not test your home equipment but once you do so, you can use it. As far as valuables go, please leave them at home. So that means any jewelry, including you know, your wedding ring, any bracelets or watches, any earrings or necklaces, anything like that you have to take off for your surgery. And we recommend don't take it off in the hospital, take it off at home and leave it at home. Again, there's not family that can come in with you the day of surgery. So this will just make sure that you know where these items are at all times and make that part easier. Glasses, hearing aids, dentures. We ask that you please bring those with you. Those are gonna help make sure that you are learning appropriately, that you can read anything we give you, that you can hear us when we're educating you, and of course, make anything easier with eating. So please bring those items, but bring the cases that they go into. As far as that goes, don't leave them on a food tray. I cannot tell you how many times I've had items accidentally get lost by being set on a food tray and getting, getting covered up by napkins or the lid for the plate. Also, do not leave any of those items sitting on your bed. It can get tangled up into a blanket. I've worked on this on the ninth floor in Boise for about nine years. And one time as a nurse on the floor, I actually needed to get glasses tangled up in a blanket without realizing it. We did find them, but it is not easy once they leave the room in the linen bag to track down. Cell phones, please, you can bring those. Don't worry about this part. In fact, it makes communication even easier without the visitors being able to be present. So you can bring your cell phone. You can bring the charger for that. We can plug it in for you at night, however it works best. And we do provide free Wi-Fi. So if you want to do something like a FaceTime, that can make that easier as well. As far as your day of surgery, directions will be given by your surgeon's office or pre-surgical screening if you are to follow this process I will mention right now. Only follow this if your surgeon wants you to do this or they state so at pre-surgical screening. Now the night before surgery, they're gonna tell you to be drinking. After midnight, no solid food, but the changes for a lot of patients coming in now is that we want you to drink the morning of your surgery. For non-diabetics, this Ensure pre-surgery drink is what we would want you to drink. It is listed right here with this picture. They are providing it at your pre-surgical screening, or it can be available at many of our St. Alphonsus MedNow pharmacies. Again, you'll notice it does say pre-surgery. It's a very specific Ensure. That is a clear carbohydrate drink. This digests very fast. This means that you can drink it and within two hours, your stomach will be empty and this will be digested. But in doing so, you'll also be hydrated by drinking this. So with this um, drink the night before, in the morning, repeat and use this insured drink. And we want you to have this completed by two hours before you arrive. The reason we want you to do this is so that you show up ready for that surgery in case, for instance, someone cancels in front of you and now you're up for surgery when you show up or in case you accidentally show up late. Those are instances where um, this will make life easier for both the OR staff to make sure that we stay on schedule and for you, all right, to make sure that you are safe. If you follow these rules, again, with drinking uh, and stopping this two hours before you arrive, you'll be safe for the surgery. The outcomes will be no different. There's no higher risk following these protocol than if you were to not drink after midnight, okay? Your stomach will be empty either way. You'll be just as safe. Uh, the reason why we are doing this where we want you to drink is that the carbohydrates do kind of give you a little bit more energy that day. By drinking, again, it'll be uh, hydrating those kidneys. They're not gonna be as stressed. 
which means that anesthesia will not even stress out even more, right? We'll have kidneys that are hydrated and they can handle anesthesia easier. Also, with this, um, you're going to be an easier IV stick. And it does show through the research and what we're seeing at St. Alphonsus, it does reduce your risk for nausea. So we just see better outcomes and see patients tolerate surgery better. Again, no solid food after midnight. You'll perform your last surgical scrub that morning before you come in. No lotion again, but also no makeup that morning. And we do not want fingernail polish on your fingers due to the oxygen sensors that we put on your fingers. Fingernail polish can cause those to not read as well. Only bring necessary items to the hospital. That's a little reminder there. When you do arrive to the hospital and you come through the main entrance, you will be greeted by a screener. They're going to follow our COVID policies. And once you do get cleared from there, you will then go up to the pre-op area. You are allowed to have one visitor with you. Again, the one visitor for the day is allowed to come up with you to this area. You're going to review your medical and surgical history at this point, And also they're going to verify what medications you took that morning. This is again given to you by the, uh, the nurse at the pre-surgical screening. So please follow what they tell you of what you can take that morning. It is very important. You will meet with the anesthesiologist in the pre-op area, and they're going to discuss the type of anesthesia you will be receiving. Um, it is good to get information from your surgeon prior to this as far as what to expect of the type of anesthesia you'll be receiving. And they can give you a little bit more information on this as well. What I can tell you is that we do most of our surgeries with a spinal anesthesia. And with that, again, they have to give you more of the information on this, but just know this is the type of anesthesia that does cause numbness down your legs. With this, we do not have to give you general anesthesia during the surgery. This does not mean that you will not receive anesthesia to help you sleep during the surgery. This just means that type of anesthesia with general anesthesia where you have to have um, essentially ventilation for breathing where there's a tube down your throat. We do not do that. You're breathing on your own. Um, again, they can give you more information on what this type of anesthesia is more like, but just know that we try to do an anesthesia that you can recover from easier, which is what our evidence shows with, um, with a spinal anesthetic. And this helps dramatically with our same day discharge population as well, with being able to get up sooner with less nausea and just with a, a better, um, better recovery process for you. You will sign the consent for the anesthesia that you decide on with your anesthesiologist and go from there. The surgeon or one of his assistants, one of his PAs or nurse practitioners will help sign your leg, your extremity with the one that you're going to have surgery on. You'll be asked by this time, about a million times it feels like of what you're having surgery on. They will make it official after asking you by signing your leg and you will be off to the OR. After prep, you will be wheeled over to the operating room. Know that you'll be in the operating room for about two hours. This includes surgical prep, where they will get you positioned onto the table and draped and cleaned. And uh, what we used to do more often was insert a Foley catheter during this time. A Foley catheter is a, a line that they insert all the way up to your bladder that then empties any urine that you're making. Instead, what we do now for vast majority of our patients is we have you pee while you're in the prep area uh, the morning of your surgery. You, that way you'll have an empty bladder during your surgery and then after your surgery you will then be monitored based off our guidelines and orders to make sure that we keep your bladder within a certain range of how full we would want it to be. We will make sure that we get you up to go to the bathroom and pee once you are safe to do so. We do have an ultrasound machine that we can then use to also keep track of how full your bladder is. And if needed, we can intervene based off our orders to then insert a catheter to empty that bladder if you are unable to pee afterwards. It is a very low percentage that this happens with patients. However, if needed, we have it available. All this is to give you the best outcome possible and to minimize the catheterizations. Uh, by doing so, we will minimize the risk of having any sort of urinary tract infection um, and helping you have the best outcome possible. 
Once your surgery is completed, we also transfer you to the bed that you will recover in. So that is the nice part about this is that you won't have to worry about transferring to another bed out of the OR. You'll be placed straight into the bed that you recover in. The next place you'll go after the OR will be into the first phase of recovery. We also call this PACU. There is no family allowed in this area until you go to your next phase of recovery, which we'll talk about the next slide. You'll be here roughly one to two hours on average. There's multiple things that need to happen before you can leave PACU. First, we'll closely monitor your vital signs, make sure that your blood pressure is stable, temperature, heart rate, respiratory rate, oxygen levels, that those are both stable and remain stable. We'll assure that anesthesia is wearing off. So this means that if you had general anesthesia, that you're waking up well and um, coherent and everything. We also wanna make sure that if you've had the spinal anesthesia, that your legs are starting to wake up. In this area, they will also manage your pain after surgery, especially with you becoming conscious again and waking up. And that if you have any nausea during this time, that it is being managed. Before you can leave this area, you do need to get cleared by anesthesia. And so there's an anesthesiologist in this area who will come and look over everything and give the recommendation of when you can leave this area. Next, you're gonna to go to your phase two of recovery. This will either be back in the surgery prep and recovery area, if you're in Boise. Uh, it could be on the nursing floor, but most likely you're gonna go back to the same place that you got prepped in. But at this point, family can come and see you again, and we'll start eating. We're gonna start with ice chips, and we'll advance your diet as you tolerate. So just keep in mind, we're not gonna have actual lunch right off the bat. Let's make sure you can handle ice chips or jello or crackers, pudding, whatever sounds good that way, and then we'll move to lunch if you handle that fine. We will do frequent vital signs and assessments while you're here, and if you end up having to stay the night, then we'll continue doing those as long as you are here. We'll monitor swelling to that surgical extremity. There are some people who swell earlier than others, so we'll give you some pointers on how to minimize swelling during this time, such as using ice and elevation, and, uh, and let you know how to deal with all that. If you've had a spinal block, that means you'll have numbness. And so we'll monitor and assess that while you're in this phase of recovery. We will not get you up and walk unless you are safe to do so. And that means that you have full strength back in your legs and full sensation before we can do that. We will start the pain management program, which I'll talk about that more in detail here in a few slides. And then you'll walk with physical therapy or nursing staff day of surgery. That is the expectation again, that you're gonna get up and walk day of surgery at least 10 feet, but of course more is encouraged if you can do that. We are gonna to try to stop IV fluids as soon as you are able to drink water and not have nausea with that. Same thing goes with oxygen. We will not keep that on you unless you absolutely need it. And so we will remove that and trial you without any oxygen on and make sure that you keep your oxygen levels up and in the area that we wanna see it at. However, keep this in mind. If you do need to stay the night for some reason, such as if you have low blood pressures, dizziness, nausea that we can't control, which keeps you overnight, then we may keep one or both of these on during that time. But as soon as you can tolerate and are doing well, we will remove those. The IV will stay in, but we'll just disconnect it. And again, we'll have the oxygen at least there if we need to put it back on. We will continue with that pain management program if you've had to stay the night. And if you stay the night, don't be surprised if they have to draw any labs that morning. Uh, and they do come early so that the doctors who do round early have them all there and ready to read. No matter what, after your surgery and when it's safe to do so, we are going to get you dressed. We'll get you up and acting like you're normal, sitting in a chair if we can or a recliner depending on where you're at. And just mimic everything that we can do that you need to do at home and make sure you can do that safely. As promised, we're gonna talk about your pain management program, just about how we approach pain and the medications we give you for your pain. Keep in mind, pain is subjective. That means you tell us what your pain is and we medicate you based off of that. And that way you do use the zero to 10 scale for your pain. We want you to have good communication with nursing staff around your pain. This means I want you to tell your nursing staff if your pain medication that you were given is working or if it's not working and we need to bring something else in. So good communication either way, especially if you plan on leaving the same day. 
because we're talking about you're staying for hours rather than days if that's the case and if we want to have a good efficient time before you leave and uh, not be wasting any time just have good communication with your nurse if they're not there in the room to ask you at that time we need to have a realistic goal for your pain so you are going to have pain after surgery in fact having some sort of level of pain will help give you boundaries on what you can and cannot do after surgery so some pain is actually good but we want it to be tolerable pain another way to think about this more simply is comfortable pain so yes I have pain but I can still sleep or yes I have pain I can still perform the task that I need to do like get up and go to the bathroom or go shower and I don't have to stop what I'm doing because of the pain uncomfortable levels of pain or intolerable levels of pain so th that's where you can't do those things I can't sleep I can't do the task I need to do that's not the expectation comfortable levels of pain is and you can think of it as about a 2 to a 4 for a realistic goal for your pain on that 0 to 10 scale we do use what we call multimodal pain management this is uh, essentially saying that we use medications that work in different ways and in specific ways so not every medication we have you take at home works the same way when they work in these separate specific ways combined we have more of a complete control of your pain and this helps us stay away from those opiate pain medications as much especially compared to from what we used to do in the past so first of all I'm going to give you a layout of medications that patients commonly receive this is you know of course can change depending on if you have allergies or a history of not tolerating these medications have this conversation with your surgeon before your surgery that last appointment before they give you the scripts to go home and fill and they can adjust if needed but generally here's what we see Tylenol of course also called acetaminophen and meloxicam also called Mobic those are different types of NSAID medications that you will most likely be taking scheduled after your surgery so and you know taking them on a regimen after a few days of doing so you will build up more of a a therapeutic level of these medications that are constantly in your bloodstream constantly giving you the effect of those medications which gives us a nice foundation to build off of for your pain control if those pain medications are not cutting it I'm still uncomfortable after taking Tylenol Meloxicam scheduled how I'm supposed to there are different medications you can take as needed most likely the first go-to medication in this instance would be tramadol also called Ultram this is considered an opiate pain medication you will take that again as needed as prescribed and this pain medication many times will help you get back to that comfortable level of pain when taken in conjunction with those other scheduled medications if it does not for some reason your surgeon will most likely prescribe a rescue medication in that instance and that's when you would take the oxycodone and so again it would be that you take Tylenol Meloxicam scheduled if that's not working that's when tramadol is available to you and if the tramadol doesn't work that's when you would take the more heavy-duty oxycodone medication but as you can see um, that we don't take oxycodone or those types of uh, opiate pain medications right off the bat and take it scheduled we're taking others instead with less of those side effects less of the risk and only taking the opiates as you need to uh, when you need to there are other medications you will receive in the hospital most likely one of those is Tordal this is an IV and said medication you may get a dose or two during your surgery this helps tremendously with getting you started on the right track for pain control it works very well and your surgeon will dose that in a safe way to make sure that it doesn't stress anything in your body such as your kidneys we do use a lower dose of that so that you tolerate it better and have a good outcome that way but again it gets you started on the right track for after surgery with pain control Lyrica is another medication that you may receive this one helps more with nerve pain Lyrica um, helps with that burning pain that you may have around the incision or with the sharp shooting pain that you may have from those nerves that are not real happy with you after having the incision and the surgery itself and so you know all these other medications we've mentioned already don't really help with that sort of pain even just a dose or two of Lyrica can, can have a lasting effect of helping suppress that nerve pain after your surgery again this is one medication you would only receive in the, in the hospital while you're here 
Baclofen is another type of medication you may receive in the hospital. It helps with muscle cramps. It's a muscle relaxant. It, the idea is you don't really take it for really stiff muscles, but more of cramping muscles. To help with stiff muscles, your surgeon is okay with you using heat on the thigh away from the incision. So to be clear, again, you can use heat not on the incision, but away from it on the thigh. Only use ice on the incision. But baclofen is there in the hospital if you're having really cramping muscles, especially at the top of your thigh. Um, and if you're having that issue, talk with your nurse. And if you need to have that prescribed for home, we can adjust if needed. But again, it's only available in the hospital many times and only for those cramping type of muscles. Um, and use heat if it's just stiff muscles. IV opiate pain medication. You noticed I haven't said anything about that yet. We really only use it if we absolutely need to. That means we've tried all the, of these different types of oral medications if we need to. Um, and if those aren't cutting it, that's where we have IV pain medication available. If you also have really a, a big issue with nausea afterwards and you can't take pills and do that um, without having any issues with more nausea, then that's when it's also available to you for the IV opiate pain meds. Uh, and for example, by the way, those are like the lot or morphine. So they're really only there to rescue you if you absolutely need it. We do not rely on those and they are not regularly given to patients at all anymore. It's best to stay on top of pain. And so what we mean by that is don't wait too long for pain medications. Understand when they're due. So most medications are available every you know three to four hours roughly. Just because they are available does not mean you need to take them. So just understand with these pain medications at home, such as the tramadol or the oxycodone, understand when they're available. You do not have to take them when they're available, but it's good to just check in and see how you're doing at that time when it's available next. And then if you don't need it, well, I'm going to give it some more time and only take it when I become uncomfortable again later on or my pain's not tolerable anymore. Uh, but again, stay on top of it. Do not let your pain get too high either. So, you know, take it when you get to that five to six range, be on top of it. Don't wait till you get to that eight, nine, 10 range, because it's very hard to catch up the pain at that point. Main reason being that it will take up to an hour for those oral pain medications to kick in. And that means you're waiting another hour before that happens and your pain could get worse during that time. So be on top of it. When you get to be uncomfortable, take your pain meds, relax. Don't be doing anything to cause more pain during this time until it kicks in and starts working more. Other things you can do, take your pain medication with food. This helps you avoid nausea. And then other things you can do to help with your pain that's not medication related. Well, I already mentioned the heat on the thigh away from the incision. That's fine. And again, using ice on the incision. Deep breathing can help. Simply repositioning the leg can help with pain. Relaxation imagery, distraction, watching Netflix if you want to, rest, taking that nap, letting that pain pill kick in. All those things help with pain management as well outside of just taking a medication. Page 11 goes into how to best prevent nausea. First of all, let us know if you have a history of nausea with any surgery and we can make sure that you are getting the medication you need before surgery to prevent that. Start with ice chips. Advance your diet is tolerated, as I mentioned earlier. Always take pain meds with food, and that will help prevent nausea. And again, communicate with your nurse if you are experiencing any nausea. Medications are available if needed. So what this means is, that as an example, I've had patients who planned on leaving the same day of surgery. One of the holdups I've had is nausea. One patient in particular had some nausea the day of surgery. They didn't feel like it was anything to tell the nurse about. You know, it wasn't severe, so I, they thought they could power through it. Then therapy happened. They got up and started moving and walking with therapy, and that nausea that they had all of a sudden became a lot more severe. We had to stop therapy, wheel the patient back to the room, and it took about two or three hours to get that patient's uh, nausea under control. It can be really hard to catch up with nausea if you let it get too far ahead of you. So if you just get a little bit of nausea, let us know and we can nip it in the bud, take care of it, and you can have a successful therapy session and go on how you're supposed to with your recovery. Postoperative risks. I'm gonna go over real quick the risks that are involved with these surgeries. Again, this is not to cause any anxiety. This is to go over how to make sure we have the best outcome to understand the risks and how to prevent them from happening. 
page 12 goes over infection. Now, antibiotics are going to be given to you the morning of your surgery, and you may get a dose or two afterwards in the hospital. When you go home, you may be given antibiotics based off the surgeon's preference as well, depending on your risk factors. Take those as they're prescribed until they run out. Again, this does not mean that you have an infection going on if you are on anti any antibiotics. This is to prevent them. As far as the scrub that you will be using before your surgery, again, when you use this appropriately before the surgery happens, this does reduce your risk for infection. Good hand, hand washing will be performed. We'll do that in the hospital. You do that home. Anytime you need to touch that incision at home, clean hands every time. Keep the incision dry. Now, some surgeons will want you to keep it dry during a shower. This means that you will put saran wrap press and seal around the dressing itself, take a nice quick shower, and then get back out, take the saran wrap press and seal off. It will not be too tacky for your skin where it causes any sores. That's what's nice about it, but it will keep you dry. If for some reason a little leak happened, that's okay. Either replace the bandage, um, or if you had the bandage off already, then pat dry the incision with something clean and allow it to air dry. If your surgeon allows you to get your incision wet during the shower, then again, take a very quick shower. Only briefly let water run over it with soap. Do not scrub it. And when you get out, do not rub it when you dry it. Just pat dry. Make it very fast. Nobody will be taking any baths or going to any hot tubs where you soak anything. Again, there will be no water aerobics. You'll be surprised how many times I hear that one, but nothing where you soak the incision until your surgeon lets you know otherwise, and that is for every single patient. Discharge education will be given on signs and symptoms of infection. This sounds a little backwards, but we want you to recognize an infection fast, and we want you to let us know right away if that's the case. So this means if it's Friday and it's midnight and you look down at that hip or knee when you get up to go to the bathroom at night and all of a sudden it's red and it's hot, that's a time to call and you don't waste any time. You call the surgeon and let them know. If it's after hours, all surgeons have an answering service that will then guide you to what the next steps are. They contact the surgeon or whoever's on call who then contacts you back. But just know that answering services are available after hours. The deal with this as well is um, recognizing it right away. The signs and symptoms are on page 12. Normal incisions will be pink. Normal incisions will be warm. But anything that is hot and very red, we do not like that. So, you know, anything that is abnormal, follow what the list shows you. Call anytime if you're worried. You'll possibly need antibiotics prior to dental work. And uh, this is even for cleanings. So there's certain periods of time, at least two weeks before your surgery, that we don't want any dental procedures done. And usually it's about three weeks, that's about the average I see, that surgeons want you to wait for even cleanings after your, sur after your surgery is done. Now these antibiotics, I'm not talking about a big long course of them. Many times what I have patients report to me is that it's amoxicillin, four tablets that you take an hour before you have your dental procedure done, even cleanings. And this will just make sure that for those patients who are higher risk for infection, that we have you covered. Your surgeon is the one to tell you what to do for this part. They will guide you through what to do, not the dentist, but your surgeon. Know that our infection rates are very good throughout our hospitals at St. Alphonsus. When you follow these procedures, you will see a difference in this outcome. As far as blood clots go, page 11 goes over the risks of those and what to look out for. What you can do to help prevent them is after your recovery, you'll notice exercises ahead of time. Ankle pumps is one of those exercises. Continue doing that after your surgery. So while you're laying there in your bed or in the recliner, pump those ankles, get the calves compressing, um, you know, get the blood moving through, and that will help make sure that you decrease your risk for blood clots. Compression devices, whether that be something what we call SCDs, sequential um, compression devices, what those do is they pump up from little compressor and it either goes around your calf or your foot. It'll pump up, squeeze, push the blood through, and then it'll relax. And it just does that uh, routinely while it's on. Uh, there may be compression socks that you use as well if ordered by the physician. Just t use those items in the hospital as directed. Blood thinners. 
Now, blood thinners are going to be ordered for every patient afterwards, and it'll vary based off your medical history and if you currently take a blood thinner. They can vary from anything from aspirin to Xarelto, Eliquis, Plavix. I see all different types based off what you have going on and what's going to be safest for you. If you are currently on a blood thinner, know that they will many times try to get you on that blood thinner after your surgery with what will be safest for why you take it and also for the surgery. So dose may change for slightly uh, a slight period of time to keep the surgery safe, but know that you'll many times go back on that same blood thinner. Uh, many patients anymore, I see them use aspirin as their go-to anticoagulant if there is no history of blood clot issues. Take that as prescribed when you go home. Now, when you are home, every two hours while you are awake, so please sleep through the night if you can, but while you're awake, get up every few hours and do something. I'm not saying exercise every time, but, you know, get up, go to the bathroom. Maybe the next time you don't have to go to the bathroom, but it's time to eat some lunch. So go to the kitchen and sit down somewhere and eat that lunch and then get back to relaxing. You can be up for about 15 minutes at a time, but then two hours, um, you know, of relaxation between that. Okay. As far as constipation goes, we already talked about prepping yourself and that will help make sure that you have a decreased risk for this. Also afterwards, continue that regimen, especially if you are relying on opiate pain medication. Uh, keep taking a stool softener or a fiber supplement. It may take three or four days before your first bowel movement. However, good rule of thumb is if it's been a day or two since your uh, surgery and you still have not had a bowel movement and you've been taking these items I already mentioned, that's where you would maybe add in milk of magnesia or something like that. Um, one of those heavier duty medications. If you need to do that and it's been a day or two, please take it. If it's been three or four days and you still do not feel a bowel movement coming, this is probably where you need to get an enema or a suppository involved now. And many patients can give that to themselves and do that safely. So if you need to do that, you can. If you have any questions about this, you can call the office and see what the next steps would be. But again, just remember, it can be three or four days before that first bowel movement. If you want to, you can increase your fiber in your diet. That's great. But if you want to increase your fiber, increase the water in your diet as well. And that will help make sure that the fiber actually works appropriately. Page six and eight go over risk for falls. This is a risk that is easily preventable. And that is by being safe. So that means always call for help when you get up in the hospital. Even standing edge of bed, we need to be there with you. Don't ever get up by yourself or with family unless you are told otherwise. Um, so again, no family is there right now. If that changes and family is present, then you know you can get up with them. But just know that in the hospital, you need to get up with staff unless your therapist says otherwise. At home, use a nightlight, pick up, throw rugs, get all that tripping stuff out of the way. At night lights, they're making them fancy now. You can get a night light that is actually motion censored. And the moment that you start moving and getting up out of bed, it's going to go off and you can see where everything is and safely get up. Please continue to use your walker until you are told otherwise. Many times the rule of thumb is you will use that walker until it is in your way. So until you get to the point where you say, I don't know why I'm using this. It's just slowing me down and I, I don't need it. Then you can stop using it. Up until that point, use your walker and be safe. Many times, a lot of our patients are still using that walker to walk into their two-week appointment. Pets, do not trip over your pets. So yes, remember the infection risk that can be involved with them, but also understand that they can, they can uh, pose a fall risk. So with your pet, know where they are at all times when you're walking around. Again, you'll go home on a blood thinner. These blood thinners Again, it will be prescribed by your surgeon and take as directed by your surgeon when you go home. This will reduce your risk for blood clots, but there are some side effects that are expected. You will be expected to bruise up and down that leg. Do not be surprised if it's all the way down to your toes and up to your butt as far as the bruising goes. So you will bruise. It's expected. You will bleed slightly more than normal. That is also expected. However, I'm just going to go over the risks that can be involved with any blood thinner, including aspirin. And always remember, any medication you take, there are side effects. But I'm going to go over the side effects that can be involved with those and how to prevent them from happening. If you do experience any of these items in red that I have listed here, then you contact your primary care physician or go to the ER. The first couple of them, vomiting blood 
it looks like coffee grounds when you do this. It's just the way that blood is digested, it will have these brown or black specks in the vomit, or red or black colored stool. If you are taking iron, do not let this concern you. However, if you are not taking iron, you're, uh, and you have the red or black colored stool, this can be a sign of a bleeding that's happening. Now, I have seen this not very often at all, but the few times I have were patients who went home taking aspirin. Sometimes NSAIDs can be hard on your stomach. The best way to take an NSAID is with food on your stomach. Now, aspirin, if that is prescribed, many times it is twice daily. It is best to take it with breakfast and then best to take it with dinner if that is the case. This will help it be digested easier. If you still get an upset stomach taking it this way, then you call the office and let them know you're not tolerating that because we do not want you to suffer through 30 days or so of taking an anticoagulant like that. If you uh, have a stressed out stomach trying to digest this for 30 days straight, that's where a gastric ulcer can develop. So just be on top of it. Let us know if you have any issues and we can help you out. Unusual bleeding that does not stop after an hour or red or dark brown urine. There are some medications that patients can be sensitive to and work too well on them. We want to find a nice threshold. Where are you safe with the surgery, with anticoagulation, while still being effective at preventing blood clots? If it is working too well where you're just bleeding and you can't get it to stop, you let the surgeon's office know or your primary care physician, and then they can dose you to the appropriate dose from there. If you fall and hit your head, you are at a higher risk for something happening as far as an injury goes. And main reason being is that anticoagulants will cause, uh, if there's a bleeding happening, it'll cause uh, you to bleed more or at least bleed longer. So this is why I mentioned already, we stress not falling. If you fall and hit your head, you're a higher risk for issues to happen with a blood thinner in your blood. So uh, if this does happen, you call the office or just get checked out. Um, but do not take this lightly. Be serious about it. We want to make sure that you stay safe. As far as miscellaneous information, driving. Do not expect to drive as a patient for three to four weeks after your surgery. First of all, that leg, whether it be left leg or right leg, it may be happening sooner or later. Can you use the pedals safely is the key part. So can you lift that leg and use the pedals easily and safely? That's your first check off. The next thing is, are you on any medication that can impair your driving? The example is opiate pain meds. Those will impair you. So please be safe with that. Once you can use the leg safely and you are off of anything that can impair your driving, that's when you can start driving. Your surgeon needs to be the one that helps make that decision with you. And if you need to get anything like a handicap placard for parking, the surgeon's office is the one who will help you with that. And lastly, we're going to talk about discharge planners. These are nurses, also called case managers, that just help with the discharge process, such as with getting different types of equipment that you may need, like we went over earlier, if you're having trouble getting a walker on day of surgery, the walker maybe isn't working for you, isn't the right size, um, having issues with getting a shower chair, you know, they're there to help get that equipment only if you were unable to do so prior. They also help with other things too, um, for those patients who are end up ending up needing to have, say, home health, which is rare, but that may be the case, or even more rare, needing to go to a rehab facility. That's what they're there for, to make sure that we can get you to these places. And um, of course, what's covered by your insurance and all that for all these things. What we also like to remind you during this time is when you are having an elective hip or knee done, is that many insurances do this as an outpatient procedure. It used to be years ago, we did this as an inpatient procedure and you had a flat rate that you would pay. Now it's more of an outpatient basis, which means simply that you pay for the services you receive. And so it can vary depending on how long you are here or the services you receive. And if you have questions about this, talk with your surgeon's office. We do have a number that you can call, which is 208-367-2000. Seven, eight. And that's 367 cost is what we call it. This is a number that you can call to get a priced estimate from St. Alphonsus for what we would estimate for your cost for having the surgery here. Again, 208 367 2678 for that number.